Hello, good evening. Welcome to everyone, both in person and online. My name is Allison Sansoni. I'm the program director here at the American Writers Museum. This week, we've been holding our first in-person programming since the pandemic began. And it's great to be back here doing this where I don't have to worry about a virtual background fritzing out or the program being interrupted by a kid with homework questions or a pet demanding food. So I, I can now tell in person how many of you are laughing at my jokes. So that helps. That being said, if you are joining us online, oh, there's the camera. If you are joining us online, please know that you're welcome as well. And know that I'm very jealous of your ability to be in your pajamas right now. Thank you all for being here with us in person and online and for valuing the past, present, and future of American writing. We're here this evening to talk about the life and afterlife of one of the 20th century's most beloved books and the intersection between Slaughterhouse-Five and the events that shaped Kurt Vonnegut's writing of it. The Writer's Crusade is a literary and biographical journey that asks fundamental questions about trauma, creativity, and the power of storytelling. Its author, Tom Roston, has written about culture, food, and film in New York City for more than 20 years, profiling artists and actors and leaders in fields from conservation to cinematography. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, Food Republic, Fast Company, and Salon, among other publications. Welcome, Tom. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to dramatically take off my mask, like a, kind of a mockery of someone else who did it dramatically. The reveal. Yeah, the there reveal. we are. Okay. There we are. <laughs> Hi. Thanks so much for, for being here. I just want to let, our, let folks know that um, at the end of this, we'll have t a little bit of time for audience questions. And if you're watching online, please type your question into the Q&A box at the bottom of the broadcast, and we may be able to take a few of those questions as well. So Tom, your book starts with a, a shocking story that you, right off the bat, you, you admit that you're not sure is true. Tell us what that story is and why you decided to make it the, the beginning of the book. Okay. I'm going to talk around it a little bit because I want people to be a little bit surprised when they, when they read it. But, um, but yes, so the, the mission of my book to, to, to write about Slaughterhouse-Five was largely to make it anew figure out a way to make it fresh. I didn't just want to write literary criticism. Um, and so it took me really almost a year um, to find a story. I stumbled upon a story, um, maybe I will reveal it, uh, that possibly Kurt Vonnegut committed a war crime. Um, and I was shocked to hear it, but I was also excited and titillated and just and also kind of greedy I was like, oh my goodness, I've discovered something about Kurt Vonnegut 50 years after he wrote this incredible book. Um, and so I wanted to report it out, because that's what I am primarily as a reporter, but also a writer. And I started thinking about myself and why this was affecting me so much. And it just I just realized I have to write about this. And um, yes, yeah, so there is this story that I follow in the beginning um, about whether or not Kurt Vonnegut killed one of the um, guards uh, at the uh, POW camp that he was in, um, imprisoned in. Tell us a little bit about starting to write a story that you know a lot of people do know a lot about. You know, this is a, a novel. There's a lot of commentary. There's a lot of information. How do you start sifting through what is already known in order to come to something? that is unknown so that you have something new to say. Yeah, I mean, I guess all writers, we, I guess there's an ego to all writers that we think that our ideas are original. Um, and so when I was looking at Vonnegut and looking at Slaughterhouse-Five, in my mind was, I was formulating this, this uh, sort of the scaffolding where I saw that the book is all about trauma and, um, which isn't a radical thought, but not only is the um, book about trauma, but we live in a culture now that is obsessed with trauma in different ways. And um, so I thought, well, I'm gonna graft that 
culture onto a look at this book and see how it's changed from the time when Vonnegut was writing it. And um, I, I, I found it fascinating, I hope other people do too, to think about how Vonnegut related to his experiences and his sense of trauma um, and how he really denied it in the way many people of his generation did that he was affected by the war um, versus the fact that we live today in, a, in an era where everyone talks about their trauma and not to, to, you know, to belittle it in any way. But I mean, you'll hear someone go to the barista and have a bad experience and they'll say, oh, I've got PTSD from the coffee that they made me the other day. And you know, that's just, it's too much now. Whereas Vonnegut um, came from an era when there wasn't enough talk about it. How did you first encounter Vonnegut's work? In like every, not a, like everybody, but like most people in high school, I read Slaughterhouse Five and I loved it. And then I ran and saw the movie or I rented the movie and um, I was obsessed with it. And um, that, that's how. And then I was, um, I explained at the, in the afterwards of the, in, in the, in the notes of the book that um, I was lucky enough to be an intern at The Nation after college, The Nation magazine, where Kurt Vonnegut wrote. And I was actually working in this little cubicle and the operator patched a call in and on the line was Kurt Vonnegut. And he was just asked for, he just said, I need someone to do some uh, research for me. And it was me. And so it was just a little moment. He gave me 50 bucks to look up a word. Um, and uh, I was totally thrilled. Um, but then jump another 20 years, and uh, I was talking to my editor about um, this series that, that he's doing uh, about books on books. He's done a book on 1984, a book on The Color Purple, and we agreed Slaughterhouse-Five would really be a great book to, to, to look at. What do you feel is the root of that, that enduring love for this book that you know there are classics that everyone that everyone knows that are still taught that are still relevant there are others that fall out of fashion what is the what is it about slaughterhouse five that has so captured our attention for so long i'm obviously very biased because i've been i've read it so many times now in the last two years and every time i read it i am just wowed by it i just cannot believe how fluid and interesting and i find th new things all the time um, well, I guess to start, it's a work of great imagination. It's a very creative book. Um, as I, can I ask, who's read Slaughterhouse Five? Okay, so most people ha have to be half people. Um, um, it's a book that goes all sorts of directions. It, it time, there's uh, traveling in time. There's aliens. There is a central character who you can't really um, trust. Uh, his perception of things. Um, and I think Vonnegut worked really hard at trying to create a character who people could identify with at the same time that he also wrote this incredibly humorous, absurd, fantastical story. So it's, it's both, both things, that it's entertaining. And Vonnegut, most of his life, before he wrote Slaughterhouse Five, he was writing short stories for magazines trying to just make money for his, his family. And he was, I mean, he was, he, he called himself a hack all the time. He was just trying to get, make money writing stories. So in other words, he was always thinking about the audience and trying to entertain them. And I think he did that at the same time that he actually was able to create a liter literary masterpiece. You spend a lot of time in the book talking about the the idea of post-traumatic stress disorder, our understanding of it, and, and the need that people have to diagnose Vonnegut with it, or you know, to to see how it relates to his characters. What is the role of PTSD in this book, and and what did you ultimately come to as a conclusion about um, trauma and what Vonnegut was writing about? So. It was it was a, it was a balancing act because um, I did see how so many people are looking at Slaughterhouse Five through the prism of PTSD, and I wanted to make that the focus of the book, but that's two very different things, right? That's a scientific, uh, a medical diagnosis, and then there's a work of creative imagination, and then there's 
looking at art for art's sake, and then there's also looking at the author and committing what we know is the biographical fallacy of saying, this book reflects the author. But Vonnegut invited that merging of different worlds, the transcending of the nonfiction and the fiction, because he wrote this, okay, this is, I keep looking down at this, this is the last five. Um, he wrote this book in which he puts his character into the novel. Um, he, he puts the author's the, himself, Kurt, Kurt Vonnegut. He uses the the he, uses, he refers to himself as I. He is in the book, so he 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 creates metafiction, and he so he himself invites readers and writers such as myself to say, okay, where does the nonfiction and the fiction you know, uh, over layer, layer over each other. And um, I don't come to a definitive conclusion about PTSD as it relates to Kurt Vonnegut. I don't think that would be fair. That would be armchair psychology. The guy's been dead for 14 years now. Um, it would be silly. But I do show that his children, most of his children think he had PT PTSD, that a lot of his friends do. A lot of important people do. Um, I think he was very much affected by uh, the war and what you know. What I would say is the trauma of war. Um, but um, just to say definitively, he had PTSD. I think is would be silly for me to do. But I will. I am willing to say that Billy Pilgrim had PTSD, and um, and uh, I'm, I'm curious uh, what what people will think when they read the book and what they have to say too. In the book, you're, you're often talking to writers of contemporary war stories, um, or at least more recent than uh, World War II. So Tim O'Brien, Carl Marlantes, numerous r authors of works about the Iraq and Afghanistan campaigns, about how they wrote their stories. What in, why did you choose to do that, and what insights did they offer about Vonnegut? Going back to, I wanted to make this my book, not just literary criticism. I want it to, to be alive. I wanted to show why this book is so relevant today. Um, and I, I think this book is as much about a character and storytelling um, and trauma, but, but, but most of all, I think Vonnegut really wanted to wrestle with how do you tell a war story? And he reflects on that all the time in the book. He's in the, well, mostly in the first and the last chapter. He keeps on writing about, how do I do this? How, you know, it's like, it's like stopping a glacier. Um, it's like, how can you write an anti-war book? Um, and he wrestled with that. And so I think it's really relevant to look today at writers who um, have learned from Vonnegut, um, veteran writers like Matt Gallagher, and this great young new writer, Matthew Molina, um, and then well-known guys like Phil Cly um, and Kevin Powers, who won all these awards for their, their books about uh, fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and I think that they too very much carry on this tradition of struggling with trying to write about war. And what I think the most sensitive and truthful uh, veteran writers do is they manage to make war look awful and not glorify it. Um, and that's another conversation I, I go through in the book. And actually, I'm going to do a little reading, I think, later. And it's going to be, um, I'm going to show, show a bit of that. Aside from the story that you, you tell at the beginning, what other new insights about Slaughterhouse-Five and Vonnegut did you discover through your research? Not giving too much away. Um, I. One of the things I find just, I'm tickled by all the time, because because I've been working on this book and I'm talking to people all the time about Slaughterhouse-Five, and I'm gonna bring this to the audience too, is I'm convinced that the book is about trauma and that the aliens and the time travel that happens in the book is a fantasy and a symptom of uh, that uh, trauma of, of the character Billy Pilgrim. Um, some people might say, hey, it's just a crazy sci-fi novel. So I guess I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask, how many people think that this is just sci-fi and has nothing to do with the derangement of this character, Billy Pilgrim? Does anyone feel like it's just sci-fi? 
time? No, no one. Yeah, I, I didn't think that. Um, I mean, but, but a lot of people do. A lot of people, I mean, and also a lot of people read it in high school. Um, and they just said, hey, it was a fun book about aliens that are the size of plumber's friends. And the guy jumps around in time. Um, and I'm shocked by that, frankly. Uh, uh, I think it's kind of cool that people feel that way because um, it shows the difference that, that people have, pe how different people bring different things to literature. Well, and that's one of the marks of a, a great work, right, is that so many people can see so many different things in it. You know, you were talking about seeing it as a science fiction. When I read it in high school, it was in a science fiction, uh, in a science fiction class. Yeah. And so that's, you know, but it wasn't, it wasn't presented just as science fiction. Obviously, there's something else here, but that was the entree into, into the book for me. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so many people, but you're right, everyone can see what they, what they bring to it themselves. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he, Vonnegut really resented that, the fact that people always put him in what I think he called the science fiction drawer, because yeah. critics, often discounted him and said he wasn't you know worth their attention and in fact i think yeah the the new york times review um of slaughterhouse five in 1969 it addressed that issue it said you know don't just think this guy is just a joke or not that science fiction or genre writing is a joke but you know we i think we know that there was a divide at least back then between that serious fiction and science fiction um and uh yeah he resented that yeah yeah, there there was a little bit more of a, a you know, separation of science fiction and, and trivializing of it right. in his time. Yeah. But it was also lucrative for him. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he was able. He was able, Well, lucrative is a hard word for to apply to Vonnegut pre Slaughterhouse Five. He was not making good money. I mean, he was just starting to just before um, uh, Slaughterhouse Five came out. But yeah, he wasn't doing well. But he was he was getting by. Yeah. You, you mentioned this a little bit towards the end of the book, but how did the pandemic affect your ability to research and um, sort of your, your information gathering? Uh, it, it helped it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, suddenly there was this pandemic, and I was at the very last stages of writing this book. It was perfect, frankly. I, just, I was just uh, at home, and I had about six more months to, to uh, writing, um, so I can't come. I couldn't complain in terms of that. It, it worked out well. Although I guess I will complain that my family had to move into my apartment, so I suddenly had all these people there. So I usually I was there alone. <laughs> so suddenly I had to deal with all that, you know. But not that I don't love my family. But um, and that there, there was that stress. But um, other than that, it was it was kind of worked out well. I can't tell you how many writers have, you know, T-shirts that have some variation of "We were born to socially distance" on them. Oh, so perfect, it, it yeah. Se yeah, it seems to, it seemed to have been a, a time for people to kind of buckle down onto into their projects yeah. if they were able to do that. Well, one of the negatives, actually, right now, right here, I I can I can tell. I'm sorry that my my voice keeps on hitting this mic in a funny way. I'm not used to, like I feel like coming out of my apartment, coming to Chicago, and doing this event. It's it, in itself, like I feel like I'm coming from a spaceship and I'm like suddenly amongst people and it, it does feel <laughs> a little like Von, Vonnegutian in a way. You're, so you're I, out of time. Yeah, out of time and out of distance from this mic, so I apologize for that. Yeah, we're, we're, we're working out the kinks in our new AV system, so hopefully everyone will just wave your arms around if you have trouble hearing something. Oh, I thought it was me. It's no, it's both of us. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, it's both right, of us okay. and everybody and all the things. All right, okay. Absolutely. <laughs> No, you're doing fine. Thank you. okay. You're doing fine. So, when you're looking at a book like this, how do you decide to to structure the narrative? What um, do you outline? Do you write it in pieces and then assemble the pieces? How do you physically put this together? That's awesome. I guess we're in the American Writers Museum, we right? Are yeah. we have to have some craft yeah, questions it, here? There's so many quotes everywhere. It's like it's <laughs> so great. Um, I have to say, I was struggling so much with the structure of it until I came upon this storyline, the, the uh, Kurt Vonnegut Nazi Slayer. Um, and that's one of the reasons I grabbed onto it. Um, because I was, I realized, okay, if I'm going to write this book about Slaughterhouse Five and I don't want it to be lit crit, um, I think I want to write about the life of Kurt Vonnegut. I want to write it. I also want to do a little bit of lit crit, so I do one chapter where I look at it. So I do those two things. 
but I also wanted to add all this other stuff about PTSD. It all didn't really come together for me until I had the Kurt Vonnegut Nazi Slayer storyline because I realized that really all this is about is how to tell a war story. And I have to thank Tim O'Brien for being incredibly generous and talking to me so much because I think for me, I also use him as a sort of a juxtaposition, not a juxtaposition, a, a compliment. He parallels in, in different ways um, uh, Vonnegut. And so I was, I couldn't talk to Vonnegut, so I talked to Tim O'Brien instead and a bunch of other people. But I think they allowed me to get inside his head um, and allowed, give me an, uh, an arc. What were some of the things that you would have asked Vonnegut if you could? Um, you know, I, I'm sure, I mean, I, mean I, would have, I would have loved to have talked to him about, about if he had trauma, point blank. Um, one of the big questions in my book is just like how sad he was and whether or not he was sad and whether or not we could talk about him being sad. And, and part of that is because the definitive biography of Vonnegut is And So It Goes by Charles Shields, which came out in 2010. And that book is very well researched. Charles Shields did a great job um, detailing a lot of Vonnegut's life. But he also just met him a couple times at the end of his life when he seemed to be really grumpy. And, um, and he depicts him that way. And his family has, uh, uh, Vonnegut's family has a real problem with that. And they're, they're not happy that that's the big biography on, on Vonnegut paints him as this sad sack. And I would love to get a sense of, of the balance or if there was a balance between his humor or if he was, you know, or you just, just try to get that, that vibe from him. Well, you asked his, his children, you know, what they, what they remember about his temperament in, in a couple of different places, and their answers were different from each other. A little bit, yeah. I mean, I think they said that he had a mix of happiness and, and sadness, most, maybe a lot of sadness and grumpiness, and, and they all, well, two of them, two, he had, he, I, I don't know if you guys know, he adopted four kids. He had three children um, with his first wife. The three children were the ones that, um, with his first wife, were the ones I spoke with. Um, and two of them said he had PTSD. And they kind of, he was kind of an alcoholic. Um, that's what I get from them. Um, and then the third says, yeah, he probably was. But really what they come down to is, he was in touch with just the the sadness of being human. I mean, I'm, you know, it's a hard, hard, hard as it is to say. He was in touch with that, and he was aware of it. He was an artist, um, and I think a lot of artists are uh, tap into that. and And he tried to uh, write uplifting work every once in a while, but really, he wanted to be realistic. And as I think a lot of us know, he was an atheist, so he didn't have some pretense to like, oh, things are gonna work out in the end. Um, he, he was an atheist who was a realist who also did want to say that, I mean, I think I'm gonna paraphrase, uh, his uncle used to say, um, if this isn't nice, I don't know what is. Um, just recognizing the good moments. And, and I think that's what his kids emphasized, that he could recognize the good times. Um, and I encourage anyone just to look him up on YouTube He's got a couple lectures where you hear him hacking with, la with laughter during some of his, his lectures. And you can tell the guy had, you know, he had a lot of spunk. So do you have a passage that you'd like to read for us tonight? Yeah, we talked about it. And so I'm going to read two things. Um, one is toward the end of the book about uh, his denial that he was affected by the war, um, which I just find interesting. Um, and then the second part will be more of a, like just give you a sense of the thrust of why um, I, I thought it was so important to write about writing a war story and, and the complexities of it. I'm gonna try not to keep on <laughs> making that awful sound that I keep hearing. I hope, I hope it's not too annoying. Okay. Quote. If I told him he had PTSD, he'd tell me to go soak my head. That's what Mark Vonnegut, his son, says. Vonnegut rarely spoke or wrote directly about what he actually felt during the war. The closest we come to hearing from him 
may be in the letter written by his uncle Alex in 1945, when the young Vonnegut tearfully exclaimed, the sons of bitches, the sons of bitches, after telling his family the story of Michael Pelea. Michael Pelea is the character upon which Edgar Derby is based on. Michael Pelea was actually a soldier in the prisoner of war camp with Vonnegut who was killed for stealing a um, jar of beans, string beans, by the Nazis. Um, yeah. In one unusually candid interview in 1996, Vonnegut admitted, I saw a hell of a lot of death, and I saw a hell of a lot of it during the Battle of the Bulge when my division was wiped out. But then, in Dresden, I saw a mountain of dead people, and that makes you thoughtful. Thoughtful. That's, this is me. Talk about an understatement. But just as this suggests he is admitting something intimately, painfully personal, Vonnegut adds, it made you think about death. I've said, too, that I would not have missed it for the world. It was a hell of an adventure. You know, as long as you're going to see something, see something really thought-provoking. Vonnegut was never one to accept the boxes that others tried to put him in, and I believe he didn't want to be pinned down as another writer traumatized by war. I suppose you'd think so. Quote, I suppose you'd think so because that's the cliche, he told Playboy in 1973. The importance of Dresden in my life has been considerably exaggerated because my book about it became a bestseller. If the book hadn't been a bestseller, it would seem like a very minor experience in my life and I don't think people's lives are changed by short-term events like that. Dresden was astonishing, but experiences can be astonishing without changing you. Calling what he witnessed during the war a minor experience seems like Vonnegut doth protest too much, and there is plenty of clinical evidence that a short-term experience, if it is harrowing enough, can in fact forever change a person. But Vonnegut's position remained consistent. He wrote in 1981's Palm Sunday, being present at the destruction of Dresden has affected my character far less than the death of my mother, the adopting of my sister's children, the sudden realization that those children and my own were no longer dependent on me, the breakup of my marriage, and so on. So that was toward the end of the book. But I just want to give you a little more about the complexity of PT writing about PTSD and uh, war writing. When it comes, can I do that, or should I stop? Okay, okay, okay. When it comes to war, the unexpected abounds. That's like one of my favorite quotes ever. I'm gonna try to read it slowly. This is from a World War II veteran and writer, Paul Fussell. I don't know if you guys know him. Is he somewhere on here? Uh, he's not, but we're, I'm familiar with his okay. work. Every war is ironic, because every war is worse than expected. Every war constitutes an irony of situation because its means are so melodramatically disproportionate to its presumed ends. Writer Carl Melentes, who served in the Marine Corps in Vietnam from 68 to 69 and has written several books about war, has compared the experience of his combat with the exhilaration akin to scoring the winning touchdown. You are in a fierce state that is where there is a primitive and savage joy in doing in your enemy, Marlentes writes in his nonfiction book, What It Is Like to Go to War. I used to hesitate to say this, worried it would only further fuel the accusation that we Vietnam veterans were the sick baby killers we were being told we were. Marlentes tells me that to deny the thrill of war obscures some of its truth. And yet, Tim O'Brien disagrees strongly with his friend on this subject. I am suspicious of that kind of rhetoric, O'Brien says. We're going to learn to be better people from killing other people? It's a position where you can justify any war by saying we're going to benefit from it personally and psychologically. This disagreement points us toward one of the difficult ironies of war and PTSD, that veterans who suffer debilitating effects of trauma sometimes have a hard time overcoming their painful uh, memories because the negative ones are fused with positive ones such as the camaraderie of living with a band of brothers or the thrill of war. I think it is Vonnegut's ability to truck in irony that allows him to shine a whole new light on such complexities. It is Vonnegut's dark, sometimes absurd sense of humor that bestows Slaughterhouse-Five with an ironic integrity that even an earnest writer such as O'Brien can appreciate. Quote, 
No one would mistake my prose with Kurt Vonnegut's, but we are interested in the same phenomenon, he says. I'm not interested in bombs and bullets and military maneuvers, but I am interested in the twisted labyrinth of memory and its corrosive effect on the human spirit. In the things they carried, O'Brien writes, true war stories do not generalize. They do not indulge in abstraction or analysis. For example, war is hell. As a moral declaration, the old truism seems perfectly true. And yet, because it abstracts, because it generalizes, I can't believe it with my stomach. Nothing turns inside. It comes down to gut instinct. A true war story, if truly told, makes the stomach believe. I want to make the case that by this standard, Slaughterhouse-Five is the rare, true war story, one that has been felt in the stomach by countless readers, and that in the decades since its publication, our view of its central, central themes, war, trauma, and the delicate act of telling war stories, have finally caught up with Vonnegut's accomplishment, allowing us to see it and the author more clearly. I believe that in making this case, it is necessary to explore a particular question that has come to dominate how many readers are today interpreting the book, whether or not Slaughterhouse-Five can be used as evidence of its author's undiagnosed PTSD. This book is a look under the hood of Slaughterhouse-Five. I want to trace how Vonnegut was able to write it as if he himself suffered war trauma, even though he said he never did, and why the novel resonates today as a metaphor for PTSD. Thank you. Folks, we'd like to take a few uh, questions here. If you're watching online, if you can type your question into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, we're monitoring that and we can uh, hopefully ask a few of those questions out. Uh, for those of you who are here in person, if you wouldn't mind stepping over to the microphone over there to, uh, to ask your question, we can do that. Don't everybody go up at once? If you don't ask questions, I'm going to have to ask them questions. There we go. <laughs> there we go. I, uh, so I've got a, a question from, from online from Adrian, uh, who wants to know, did Vonnegut write for his sister's approval? Huh. I think that's a, a loaded question. I think that person probably knows that, yes, that's what he said. He said that he wrote for one person, his sister. Um, she was... Uh, five years older than he, he was and apparently she was a total character totally funny a great artist um, and um, yes he said he wrote for one person which I, I always found that very interesting and unusual I don't I don't really relate to it myself um, but yeah he said he wrote for one person his sister Alice and um, and she died tragically uh, in 1957 so um, that's one of the many tragedies that he had to endure. Well, it's a difficult question, right? Do you, you know, how much you consider your audience when you're writing? You know, you yourself, I mean, when you were writing this book, did you, were you writing it for anyone in particular? Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I guess I do share this with Vonnegut. I was primarily, I've been a magazine writer for most of my life. And so it's not, I'm not, I'm not a novelist. Um, I don't have pretenses to creating art. I write to uh, speak directly to an audience uh, and to get the approval of an editor. And he got so many rejections from editors and he worked so hard to get approval from an editor so that he could get you know, his work into a publication. So um, even though he says he did write just for his sister, um, uh, it's interesting, as I mentioned before, he really wrote to, to make a living. Um, but I think, I do believe him that in his heart of hearts, he wrote for her and possibly the the important things he wrote for her yeah yeah and then and then i mean unfortunately um he wrote slapstick uh which some would consider his worst novel i would certainly it, i mean i adored vonnegut there are a lot of his books most of his books i think are fantastic um slapstick is generally considered not good i would be in there with, with that opinion um but that book was very much about his relationship with his sister Folks, if you want to avoid a pop quiz, this is your last <laughs> chance. <laughs> take up the oxygen or we'll take it up. 
I'm curious, as you've been talking to people about the about the book and about Vonnegut, have you have you heard things from Vonnegut fans from his incredibly involved fan club that you that surprised you? Um, I think I, I'm getting I'm I, for me it's really I'm making a, I'm, I'm making connections with people who um, I wouldn't normally make connections with. I went to Indianapolis and I spent time at the Kurt Vonnegut Museum and Library, which was is a fantastic place. Um, and I met the, some of his biggest fans, and um, no surprise here, a lot of them were teachers, um, but some of them were, you know, salesmen. Um, and so, yes, that that sense of the the diversity um, is great. Uh, I live in Brooklyn, and I hear about all these, you know, uh, my friends' kids who are in high school. You know, are they love Vonnegut too? So. It, the, the sense of diversity is, is fabulous. I've yet to be approached by the Van, Vonnegut fan club, though. I'm, I'm curious. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I hope that happens. I have a question um, from Andrew online who wants to know, did you find any examples of PTSD in any of Vonnegut's other works? Oh, that's great. Uh, yes, that, a big part of my book is actually developing this, you know, this thesis about whether or not he had um, PTSD. And so, yeah, I look at all his other work. And um, yes, definitely. I mean, he, I think the first time, is this fair to say? Yeah, I think the first time is in um, um, God Bless You, um, Mr. Rosewater, um, if I'm getting that title right, wrong, apologies, um, in which the, the character, the main the protagonist, mistakenly kills um, a German, um, there are a couple of Germans who are firemen, and one's a kid, um, and then he's traumatized by it. Um, and uh, you know, the fact that just like three, four years before he wrote Slaughterhouse Five, he was working through this theme um, of of a character who was clearly, who actually the big question about is whether or not he's insane, and he's driven insane largely by this um, this incident during World War II. Uh, so that is the biggest one. Um, um, Bluebeard, uh, which came much later in the 1980s, I think that's a character um, who had who had to work through trauma, and it's it, I, I like to refer to it because I think it's the one book where the character kind of comes through and he's he kind of does he's he looks like he's going to be doing all right. He looks like he's going to come through it okay. Um, whereas like Billy Pilgrim, he's kind of lost to his time travel. We have a question from Judy, who want, uh, who's watching online. Thank you, Judy. Can you elaborate on the title of your book, The Many Lives of Slaughterhouse-Five? Well, the Writer's Crusade, I guess people should get, is, is that the subtitle of Slaughterhouse-Five is The Children's Crusade. Um, and so I twisted that a little bit, and I thought of Vonnegut's whole crusade to write his book. Um, and um, it is a little tongue-in-cheek because I also kind of refer to my crusade to write this book um, and um, and yeah and then the many, many lives of Slaughterhouse Five is he one of the things I do in my book is I'd look at all the drafts he did he worked on this book for 23 years and he kept on rewriting it and rewriting it and rewriting it and um, and I, I was I had a wonderful time at the Lilly Library in um, Bloomington at in Indiana University where I got to look at all these old versions of the book. And so The Many Lives also has double meanings or triple meanings, um, that they're, the book that itself had many different lives. Um, but also, of course, we have a book here, his book, Slaughterhouse Five, which is about all these alternate realities um, that the Tralthamadorians, the aliens, um, believe in. So it's just a kind of, a, I, hopefully, an, an amusing way to um, approach a fabulous novel. I have a question from Carl. Um, out of your last three books, which one was the most emotionally satisfying for you? Um, I'm not going to pick amongst my children. Because um, each one speaks to me in different ways. Uh, but I guess, I guess right now, I'm feeling this one right now a lot. So I, I guess, I mean, I have to say right now, this one. Um, my, my first book was about the video store era. Um, I grew up in the 80s, and I used to go to video stores all the time, and film was, is a big thing for me. Um, and so that meant a lot to me. 
Um, then my next book was about uh, Windows on the World, the restaurant that was at the top of the World Trade Center. So that's very much about 9-11 in New York, and I'm a New Yorker. So that was important to me. But I think, actually, thanks, Carl. Thank you, Carl. You've just made me realize that maybe this is the most close to me because it's about um, something I read when I was a teenager. It's something about being a writer. Um, and um, it's about how to live a life, how to live a good life, and trying to understand the psychology of a person. And, and of course, I'm trying to understand my own psychology all the time. That's what we all do. Um, so this one. Thank well, it's, you. it's the new baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess maybe. <laughs> We've got a, a request that you uh, talk about player piano. I'm going to assume that you know what that is. Yeah, that's um, uh, Kurt's first, first, first novel. And unfortunately, that might be someone's favorite. And um, I'm not a huge fan of it. Uh, it. It was his first novel that he wrote. Um, to me, what's significant about it is that he finally got to write a book. Um, and he had worked so hard. I guess it was, I think it came out in 1952 about. Um, so it was about seven years after he got back from the war. And um, he struggled so mightily to get that book out. And he himself mocked it a little bit and said it's just kind of a ripoff of A Brave New World. Um, and it sort of is, but I think, I mean, I appreciate it because as I do in my book, I look at the tra trajectory of his career and um, you can see that there's a lot of, uh, he's working through a lot um, and that's what writers do. And I really do believe that Vonnegut's entire career, all his novels, he was working his way toward writing Slaughterhouse-Five. And, and maybe that's why he was kind of gloomy afterwards because what do you do after you spend your whole life trying to write this, you know, this, you know, great American novel? Um, uh, and he did struggle. He wrote some really good books after that, but nothing came up. You know, nothing was on par with that. If if not for Slaughterhouse Five, what is your favorite of his wor other works? Um, I I would say uh, Mother Night, which uh, is. It's one of his earlier novels, but it's it's, it's very tight um, and it's very interesting. It's uh, it's to me it's it's kind of one of the, his more clean novels. And then uh, um, um, Breakfast of Champions, sorry, Breakfast of Champions, because that's the book that came after right right after Slaughterhouse Five, and it's the book that he says isn't very good. It's like one of his least favorites. Um, and that's just the kid in me. It's totally puerile and totally funny, and I laugh the most at reading that. And uh, so that those those three are my favorites. Um, Allison and Tom, we have a question from online that is a little too much to type out in a text. So this is from Mike, who sounds like a teacher. He says, "My students often feel conflicted after they finish the novel whether Vonnegut is advocating for the alien slash Billy Pilgrim worldview of fate." So it goes, or free will. Most Vonnegut is advocating for raging against faith, the idea we can't just close our eyes to the experience, we can't just do the easy thing and drive on like Billy does while driving through the ghetto. But they find it odd that Billy's giant moment of realization, I was there, ends with him getting his voice to advocate for the acceptance of fate and not free will. Do you have any thoughts on Vonnegut's stance on fate versus free will? Yeah, great. I wish I was taking your class. Um, if you, uh, yeah, I've been tormented by that uh, because it really does feel like, I mean, so the Tralfalmadorian view of things is that we are bugs stuck in amber, that this, that there's no free will, that basically we are always in this moment of time and you can't change it and the next moment will be always there well, actually there are no next moments that's very human of me to say that there's no sequence of moments um and it does feel like he is uh advocating for that but again god i'm getting so many for me epiphanies i don't know if they're for anyone else but for me they are um i believe that vonnegut was presenting I've said before, and I've said throughout this conversation, that Vonnegut was saying, was writing this character, Billy Pilgrim, as if he had had experienced trauma, and so he was making up these 
aliens and uh, the time travel. And so this, char- this character, Billy Pilgrim, seems to believe in um, no free will. And I think the reason why Vonnegut would not advocate for that is because he is saying that Billy is trying to cope with the trauma of a war. And so not only does he not, so, so Billy believes not in free will, he also believes that when people die, it doesn't hurt, it's okay. Because if that person's dead, that person's been alive in the past. You know, for me, that's clearly a rationalization, a way to cope with trauma, with the death all around you. And so the same thing with trying to cope with free will. So I do believe that Vonnegut, you know, he's an artist, so he's not going to spoon feed it to you. He didn't, you know, he's not going to hit you over the head with it. But um, yeah, I, I believe that you should tell your class that Vonnegut is, is letting the reader decide, but showing pretty clearly that Billy, this sad, traumatized, uh, filthy flamingo, is um, wrong in, in not believing in free will. I'm very glad that uh, you did not try to text all of that to us. Yeah. But th- and thank you, Mike, for, for such an insightful question and for teaching American writers. <laughs> right. Of course. Is there anything that we haven't asked you tonight that you came here wanting to talk about? I, I just want to say I'm really happy to be here because American Writers Museum, just the sense of like Kurt Vonnegut, an American writer. You know, the, the, So this is a great place to be. I mean, as we know, our people know Kurt Vonnegut. Um, he went, he grew up in Indianapolis, but after um, the war, he went, he moved to Chicago. He didn't do well at the University of Chicago. Um, and then he also happened to make Billy Pilgrim, his character, um, get assassinated in Chicago. So, uh, you know, Chicago is an important thing, uh, important city to Vonnegut in different ways. Um, and just, just to be here is just very, very cool. Thank you. Thank you for being here, and thank you, everyone, for being here with us tonight. And thank you to everyone who is watching online.